So how do we have an open, honest approach to Islam and Muslims? Well, we're joined this morning by pastor and author Carl Gallups, who also happens to be a former law enforcement officer. Now, Carl has studied biblical prophecy and Islam extensively, and his latest book, Be Thou Prepared, gives very practical biblical advice on how to navigate the challenges and opportunities we face these days as believers. <coughs> Excuse me. Carl, welcome back to Stand Up for the Truth. Mike LeMay, thank you so much for having me. It's always a joy to be with you, my brother. Love it, man. Well, Carl, you do bring a very unique perspective to this discussion on Islamic terror. You're a pastor. You studied Islam. You're a dedicated student to biblical prophecy in the Middle East. And you're a former law enforcement officer. And I'd like to start uh, with your perspective first from the law enforcement side of things. Now, we're going to hear an ongoing debate over the shooting in California, was it Islamic terror or was it workplace violence? What uh, what conclusion are you coming to or what are your thoughts based on what we know so far? Yeah, well, what we know so far is it's all of the above. I mean, it obviously the guy was connected there and he worked there and there was violence that took place. An employee, you know, com- comes back with guns and opens fire. Now, if, <clears throat> excuse me, if there were not such a deep, Islamic terrorism connection as well, we could simply relegate it to uh, uh, to workplace violence. Now, you know, now listen, I, listen, all of this is a matter of putting labels on something, isn't it? The bottom line is 14 people are dead and 17 people are m- wounded terribly, and, and a horrific massacre took place. Call it what you will. It was a horrific massacre. And, of course, it took place in a workplace. But here's, here's what we know. This man and his wife had just been in Saudi Arabia. He had just brought her back. They were both Muslim, uh, uh, excuse me, mosque attending, uh, devout, devout Muslims, according to their own family members. This is not just something I'm making up. Uh, they they came back dressed in camouflage, in masks, carrying assault weapons. They had pipe bombs and bombs. Uh, news reports have indicated that their home, once they went into it, it was a, quote, bomb-making factory. Uh, we now know, according to other news reports, that they had been in touch with Islamic radical extremists in Saudi Arabia prior, just prior to all of this. So were they Muslims? Yes. Was it terror? Yes. Was it premeditated? Yes. Was it a massacre? Yes. So was it Muslim terrorism? Yes. <laughs> was it workplace violence? Yes. But for the media and for the government to, to relegate it as, quote, oh, it was, it was just a tragic case of workplace violence is just insulting to the intelligence of the vast majority of the American public. So, I, I, you know, this political correctness is killing us, Mike. I said many years ago in writing and on radio, many years ago, probably 10, 12 years ago, I listed some of the things that were absolutely destroying and rotting America to the core. One of them, of course, is teaching our children they came from monkeys. The other one's the abortion holocaust. The other one is the radical homosexual agenda. Way back then I was talking about it. And then the other one is this political correctness. It's all wrapped up. And let me tell you where political correctness started. In the Garden of Eden, when Satan came to, came to Eve and said, Did God really say? Mm. That's what political correctness is. It's, listen, let's change the words of truth. Let's change what you see. I know what you see, but don't call it that. Let's call it something simpler. You know, God, God, God didn't mean for you to look at it like this. He doesn't mean for you to say this. And that's where it all begins. It's, it's that spirit of nakash. Nakash is the Hebrew word for the serpent. Uh, that, 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 that magical whispering in your ear, uh, making you think you're hearing something that's true, when as a matter of fact, it's a perversion of the truth. And it's destroying our nation, Mike. Oh, oh, it is indeed. You know, Carl, we were talking with Elijah Abraham yesterday, who's a former Muslim, and what you're hearing out of the Obama administration is a, 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 they don't want to label this uh, radical Islamic terrorism because, in their words, well, we don't want people to broad brush all Muslims. But by not calling this what it is, aren't they leading people to broad brush all Muslims? Well, yeah, yes, and that's the, the, and the irony and the hypocrisy of it all is that they don't hesitate to broad brush all Christians or all gun owners. Obama himself did that. The bitter clingers, they cling to their guns and their religion down in the South. You remember that? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, broad brushed all of us, and I and I say us because I'm I live in the South, but you know that that was his um, uh, characterization. Of course, there are a lot of people who love the Word of God and who also uh, love the Second Amendment in the North as well, and all over the nation. But but the, this administration is so quick to broad brush all the other sectors. You know, Black Lives Matter. You know, white white lives don't apparently, and you know, yellow lives and brown lives and whatever, whatever else. You know, Black Lives Matter broad brushing. Uh, cops, the cops acted stupidly. Okay, that came from the president's mouth. Okay, broad brushing. Until now, there's this war on cops. You know, all cops are evil. I mean, you know, the, the administration hadn't used those words, but that's the message that's being sent. And so, the the hypocrisy of it is this. What? Just switch it all around. Think of this. I want your great Q90 audience to think of this. What if that had been a group of Muslim employees, off in a corner somewhere in a room, celebrating an Islamic holiday? Because what it was, it was a Christmas celebration or a Christmas party. Now, I don't, I don't think they're all Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians. I don't know that it was a distinctly Christianized celebration, but it was a Christmas party. What if it was a Muslim party with largely Muslim employees and a bunch of evangelical Christians walked in masked up with assault rifles and pipe bombs in their home full of bomb-making equipment when it was all over, and they actually shot at the police and tried to kill police in the pursuit later? What would it be called? Hate crime, right? Of course! And it would be called some kind of radical, uh, you know, Christian uh, right-wing hate crime. And, and, and then, uh, before you know it, the media would be broad-brushing gun owners and Christians and Christian radicals. And you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, the, hypo- the hypocrisy is, out, is, is astounding. It is. You know, continuing on the vein of law enforcement, Carl, of course, our president got up and touted more gun control laws. You know, guns are the problem, not people. First and foremost, from your expert opinion, is the problem lacks gun control problems? Yeah. Well, you know, guns are the problem, not people. That's the exact opposite of the truth. Yeah. The biblical truth and the historical truth. Take away all guns. Do you know there was a time in world history when there were no guns on the planet? Mm-hmm. Did they still have wars, mayhem, killing, terrorism? Absolutely. Yeah, they used bows and arrows and spears and, 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 and all the military equipment that they could devise. And, and Genghis Khan, I don't think he had a single gun, did he? Not a one. Yeah. So, and I mean, you could, so, so the point is, he says, you know, they say guns are the problem, not people. That's Nakash. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. That's the spirit of Nakash. That's the. That's the serpent speaking. That's the the exact opposite of the truth, mm. and the exact opposite of the truth. The truth is, take away guns, and they still had bombs. They had pipe bombs. Take away pipe bombs, and people can still have knives and hammer. What are we going to do? Are we going to outlaw hammers? I can beat your brains in with a hammer. I can go into a room with a hammer, or a sword, or a sickle or an axe, a room full of unarmed people, and I can kill a lot of people before something happens to me. So the point is, the problem is, we are desperately wicked. We, humanity, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're not in need of more laws, rules, and regulations. And there's nothing wrong with common sense laws, rules, and regulations. That's a part of an orderly society, and that's a biblical concept. But we're not in need of just one more law to save us. No. We're in need of a Savior. We're in need of a heart change. And, of course, we know as individuals, you and I, as ministers of the gospel, um, one of my great purposes in life is changing the hearts and minds of person, one heart at a time, people to people to people, ministering the love of Jesus Christ. But we also, that also applies to societies, Mike, as you know, and to cultures, to nations. Our nation is heartsick. Our nation has turned its back on God. About a hundred years ago, we began telling our children for generations that there is no God and that they came from an accidental explosion of a sludge pond and their greatest, their nearest ancestor is, is, is a common ancestor to a, a chimpanzee. I mean, what, what kind of godlessness is that? I mean, we, we, we have spit in the face of God in this nation for a solid 100 years. 
and and out of that grew this horrific abortion holocaust you can't kill 50 million of your own children unless you convince the generations that follow that look there are no eternal consequences you're nothing more than an animal that's nothing more than a blob in your womb do with it as you wish now don't step on a turtle egg on a beach we'll put you in federal prison but you know it i mean it's just insanity and then, of course, came the massive sexual revolution, and we turned our back on God's Word with that, and now we're paying the penalty in our body. The Center for Disease Control, Mike, says one-third of America of Americans are carrying STDs. One-third. One-third. Uh, one-third. Center for Disease Control, that's on their website. One hundred million-plus people in America have massive STDs in their bodies. One-third third of us. By the way, that number one-third is a biblical number of judgment. Read the book of Revelation, right? Mm, yes. One-third of us, Mike, and that doesn't count the number of now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of influx of illegals coming into our country and refugees. We don't know what they're carrying. People coming across our borders, we don't know what disease they're carrying, but just, you know, just American citizens, one-third of us have STDs. So, that's the deal, Mike. It goes all the way back to us turning our back on God. Guns are not the problem. America has a deep, deep black heart problem. Mm, and well said. You, yeah. And, and, and one more thing I'll say real quickly here. I ask people, you know, Obama comes right out after, after this, of course. He n- never lets a good crisis go to waste. And he comes out, you know, we've got to get a grip. We've got some serious thinking to do. You know, guns are the problem, not people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My question is, and no liberal will answer this. No liberal can answer this. Really, what gun control laws could have been in place before that tragedy that would have prevented it? Exactly, Carl. You know what it is? It, this liberal mentality, this mindset that if we pass a law, people will automatically obey it. I, it yeah, and, and we do, but the criminals don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not a big bumper sticker guy, but I remember one I saw years ago that says when out, when guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns, yeah. and there's some truth yeah. in that. Well, it's a, it's a cliche, but there's absolute truth in it. Because, see, this is what I've told people. I said, look, if we could rid the world of guns, rid the world, and you could guarantee me there would be no guns on the black market, no guns that criminals could get a hold of, no guns that anybody could use, I would be the first to turn mine in. I'm fine with that. I don't, I don't have a killer heart. I don't have a warmongering heart. I, but I do have a heart for defending my family and my loved ones. And I know there's evil out there, and I know there are killers and warmongers out there who would love to catch me without a gun so that they could enslave me, or worse, and or my family. So until there are no guns on the planet, I'm going to have a gun, and I'm going to defend myself and my family. I don't go around looking for a fight. I don't play cop, even though I used to be one. <laughs> and, and, and I don't play superhero, and I know that having a gun doesn't make me invincible. But it does mean I'm not a sitting duck. It does mean I'm not a helpless victim huddled in a corner whimpering as somebody loads up five or six clips in their gun and picks us off one by one. Mm. And so if if if... If the gun, if the world could be rid of guns, I'd turn mine in. But here's the problem. The very next day, you know what the evil people would do? They'd be building spears and bows and arrows and other weapons, and they'd be building bombs and dynamite sticks tied together. I mean, the criminals, the murderers, are always going to have a way to do their destruction. Guns are not the problem. Mm. Our guest this morning, Carl Gallup's his latest book, I love it, uh, Be Thou Prepared. It gives good, practical, biblical advice as to how we handle these days. Hey, Carl, one more question on the law enforcement side. I'm going to really yeah. put you on the spot here, brother. Let's just assume for a minute you were the chief of police of Green Bay, Wisconsin, and mm-hmm. the mayor called you in and said, Carl, we just saw what happened in Sacramento. What should we do? What would your advice be to a mayor of a city right now? Uh, yeah, if you first, I would have some I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, if, you were, if you were its chief law enforcement officer. Yeah, if I was the chief law enforcement officer uh, and the mayor called me in, first I would have some questions for the mayor. Well, first of all, I don't know how, how the mayor law enforcement works uh, where you live. Um, in, in Florida, mayors have no control over the sheriff or chiefs of police unless 
unless the chief of police is, is hired by the city and a mayor. But the sheriff, who is the uh, constitutional law enforcement officer of the county, uh, mayors have no control over them. So uh, are you assuming that I would be working with the mayor on a voluntary basis? Yeah, or, yeah. He, uh, just, he just says, Carl, I need some advice yeah. on how to handle this stuff. Oh, 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 okay, okay. Well, one of the first things I would say is how, how willing are you to be politically incorrect, deal totally in truth, and be a mayor who is follows a constitutional republic and the laws of our land rather than a banana republic kind of mentality. Because if the mayor says, look, I'm willing to follow the law, reasonable fashion, legal constitutional fashion, and I'm willing to, to speak and to call something what it is, then we can get something done. But if the mayor insists on dancing around issues and flowering up words and, and, and patting people on the head and assuring them that what they're seeing is not really what's happening and, um, and then twisting and perverting laws to accommodate certain sections and groups of people over other groups of people, then nothing can be accomplished. We'll keep going down the sewer we're going down. But let's assume the mayor says, look, I'm willing. And by the way, this is one reason I'm not endorsing Donald Trump, but this is one reason why he is so insanely popular right now, Mike, because he is... He is eschewing political correctness, and he's refusing to be bullied. And people admire that. People are longing for that. So, again, if I were chief of police, I would go to the mayor and I would say, look, it, this, 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 the approach to this needs to be balanced. This is America. Okay? We, don't, we don't go around hating people, but, uh, but on the other hand, we need to call it what it is. It needs to be, our approach needs to be eclectic, that is multifaceted. This is going to be hard work. We need to be vigilant. We can't give up. This is going to go on and on and on. And we need to encourage our citizens to stay engaged in the process. Now, once all of that is established and, and, and the mayor understands, we're not going to be politically correct. We're going to call it what it is, and we're going to be fair, and we're going to, uh, to, we're, we're going to be kind, of course, to our citizens, but we are not going to tolerate lawlessness, wickedness, terrorism, and everything that breeds it. Then... I, you know, I would start an education process. I mean, people need to know what's happening. Listen, Mike, do you know <laughs> Islam was America's first military enemy? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Barbary Coast, right? Exactly. Yeah. The, ma the Navy and the Marines were formed, I mean, because of the Barbary pirate problem. And, you know, the, 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 the is it the Navy song from the halls of Montezuma? The Marines. No, that's the Marines. Marines. Yeah, the Marine song. From the halls of Montezuma, of course, that was Mexico, American-Mexican wars, to the shores of Tripoli, the Barbary states of North Africa, the Barbary pirates. They, they, they were all, you know, working for their states to, to uh, piracy on the high seas to bring in the, 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 the goods and the gold. And, and you know, and, and they became um, America's first real naval uh, and international enemy. And, and, you know, people talk about, well, Thomas Jefferson had a Koran. Yeah, he had a Koran. He was studying the religion so that he could know what he was up against. And he discovered that it really wasn't a religion at all. It's a political movement. It's an ideology. And it's based upon world domination. And, uh, and, and so, you know, if I were the chief of police, I would make sure the mayor and, the, and, and, and my department and, and people knew what we were up against. Anytime the military goes into a region where it's fighting a battle, it, it thoroughly educates its soldiers and its officers on the enemy. I mean, what's the ideology? What's, what's, what's this all about? What are they after? What are their goals? What are they thinking? And so I'm not saying all Muslims are our enemy. I am not saying that. And if a person wants to come to America, abide by our constitutional republic, become a thoroughly assimilated American, and then practice their religious beliefs that do not include the overthrow of our government or terrorizing our citizens, uh, and keeping our and, and it does involve keeping our laws. Then great, we have a First Amendment. Feel free. You can be an atheist in America if you want, uh, but but abide by the constitutional laws and framework of our culture. So we need to educate. We would need to educate. Our officers, our commanding officers, our troops, if you will, uh, our, our government authorities as to what's going on. We need to talk to them about Sharia. 
a lot of people don't understand what that's all about, Mike, and what they're trying to accomplish and how they move into an area and populate an area and run for city council and run for county commissioner until they have a majority, and then they start implementing slowly but surely little elements of Islamic tradition, Islamic law, and Sharia. We've seen it happen in Dearborn, Michigan. We've seen it happen in other places around the nation. Uh, There have been several states, I think 20 states, I may be wrong on that number, but a number of states that have had to deal directly with, with direct attempts at the Islamization and Sharia law uh, encroachment in their states from their Muslim populations. So I would work with the mayor and, and the uh, city officials and all of that. I, w- I would in- uh, I, uh, I also hear something else, Mike. Now, this is, this is a little tougher, but I, w- I want your audience to hear this. What if, see, I'm a pastor of a, of, a, of a large Baptist church on the Gulf Coast. What if in my pulpit, Mike, every Sunday... I was encouraging my people to overthrow the government, to take up arms, get in the street, and terrorize people, to, to, uh, to commit acts of atrocity and terrorism. What if I was doing that from my pulpit? What do you think the reaction of the government might be? Uh, probably throw you in jail. Yeah, well, there are all kinds of laws against that. I mean, I, I have freedom of speech in my pulpit so far uh, in America, and that's one of the great things of America, to preach the gospel, to speak truth. I can even speak to politics and, and, and everything as long as I'm dealing in truth. But the key thing is, and I understand this law, and it's, I think it's a biblical, uh, it makes biblical sense, and of course it's federal law. As long as I'm not using my pulpit to incite violence mm-hmm. or the violent overthrow of the government or the killing of people, et cetera, terrorism. But yet it's being done in certain mosques. Not all mosques, not all imams, not all Muslims. But it is being done. We have evidence of it. We know it. We know it's going on. So I would want to educate the mayor about that and all of the law enforcement officials. They need to know this stuff, Mike. And then we need to logically, rationally, and lawfully enforce the laws we have. If a mosque is proven to be, uh, or, or any any organization, but right now we're talking about Islamic terrorism based upon what we just saw the other day take place in California. But if we discover, for example, that the mosque, that those guys that we're going to, that they were getting these directions from the officials of the mosque or from the imams, at the very least, I would bring those officials under legal uh, constraint. I would arrest them and perhaps even close the mosque down. Yeah. But, you know, those are tough things we have to do, and uh, we're, we're just not a of tough... Course. We're not willing to do the tough things anymore. Our guest this morning, Pastor Carl Gallops, when we come back, we're going to turn our attention to prophecy in the Middle East, and I'm going to ask Carl this question. Is there a possible biblical connection with this Muslim influx and violence we see in America? If you want to contact us about any of the topics discussed today, email your questions to comments at standupforthetruth.com. You can also call your questions in on the queue lines, 494-9010 in Green Bay or 1-800-979-9010 nationwide. Stand Up For The Truth will continue in a moment on Q90FM. Karen and Dan Weber of Belkey Financial Group believe in the life-changing ministry of Q90FM. Serving Northeast Wisconsin since 1977, they provide investment management and retirement planning. Located at 2131 Calumet Drive in New Holstein. The phone number is 800-236-5773. The website, B-E-L-K-E-Financial.com. Securities and advisory services offered through SII Investments Incorporated. Member FINRA SIPC and a registered investment advisor. Belkey Financial and SII are separate companies. Dr. Emerson Egridge calls it the crazy cycle, and all of us who are married go through it at one point or another. According to Ephesians 5.33, it's a healthy balance between love and respect that's the basis for a successful marriage. And this is what's making the Love and Respect conferences so uniquely successful. Dr. and Mrs. Emerson Egridge share how you can get your marriage off the crazy cycle. Coming to Appleton at Pathways Church, January 29th and 30th. What a great Christmas gift for your marriage or for another married couple you cherish. Register today at loveandrespect.com or q90fmtickets.com Joe to go 
Coffee of Green Bay and Appleton are proud to support Q90FM. Joe to Go offers a variety of gourmet coffees, smoothies, gourmet teas, and muffins. Our Green Bay location has a new gift shop and a meeting area for your business group or Bible study. In Green Bay, we are at the corner of East Mason at 821 South Huron. And in Appleton, we are at 3419 North Richmond, just off Highway 41. Joe to Go, serving coffee and honoring God. Proud to support Q90FM. Trust Construction and Roofing is proud to support Q90FM. With 16 years experience, we serve all of Northeast Wisconsin in a way that brings glory and honor to God. We install new roofs, repair damaged ones, and provide complete services. We are fully insured and provide no obligation estimates for any job. Our phone number is 615-6556. That's Trust Construction and Roofing, 615-6556. Bringing glory to God by serving His people. People are committed to many causes, saving whales, ending starvation, and helping the homeless. This week on Let My People Think, Ravi Zacharias considers the single most important cause in all of life. Let My People Think with Ravi Zacharias, Sunday mornings at 8 on Q90FM. If you want more info on the topics of today's show, then visit StandUpForTheTruth.com. Now, back to Mike LeMay. Our final segment with pastor and author and former law enforcement officer Carl Gallops. Let's go to our phone lines. Ron, good morning. What is your question for Pastor Gallops? Good morning, Mike and uh, Carl. Great to hear from you again. Uh, uh, the major media will not I uh, obviously identify you know, the power behind these massacres as uh, influenced by the Quran. We know words have power. Uh, take the opposite end of the spectrum, and as a Christian, you carry out the word to its fullest, and you become like Jesus Christ. Um, the general public is obviously, because they're uh, um, biblically illiterate, are, are, are ignorant of the spiritual battle going on here. So... Uh, the hard thing that I find for myself and other believers is called as followers of Jesus Christ to die to self. I mean, does, does your intelligence come into play where you know why they're here? I mean, it's something that, as provider and protector, men are supposed to be stewards of what God has given them, and the uh, debate continues. I mean, do we pick up arms to defend not so much ourselves, but the women and children? Hmm. And, um, you know, you know, take the situation in San Bernardino. When the people were really uh, in fear, who did they call on? They called on for rescue and help the law enforcement. Right. And yet well, uh, the, the, the picture is to come against law enforcement, and it's just like uh, the Bible. Uh, they don't need God right now, but someday oh, yeah. I mean, we will stand yeah. before him and judge well, him. Well, let me, let me jump in and, and, and address your, your very, very uh, salient question. I mean, I mean, Ron, listen, this is a question people ask. And I've got to say this, Ron. Please hear me. Please hear my heart. I'm not trying to sell a book, but that's what my book is about. Be thou prepared. That's one of the things I go into great length to deal with. Why? Because people ask it all the time, Ron. I'm a former law enforcement officer. I spent 10 years, two different sheriff's offices, the Florida Department of Corrections, the state prison systems, from an administrator to a patrol officer to an investigator, 10 years in that, 30 years in ministry, dealing with people's lives and tragedy and trauma. I live on the Gulf Coast, hurricanes, Katrina, Ivan, Dennis, decimated our area, death and destruction. I've been dealing in this stuff for 40 years, and people have a ton of questions. How prepared should I get? Should I get prepared? Do I don't want to look like a nut, don't want to look like an idiot, should I have a weapon, should I take up arms, should churches be armed, should churches have security teams, should I have a gun on me at all times, or just in my house, or just in my car, or should I even worry about that, shouldn't I just be a person of faith and just let God protect me, I mean, all of these questions are so good, and the bottom line is this, let's use what just happened in California, California has some of the strictest gun control laws in the nation, yet a gun violence massacre took place. And so Obama comes in and says, we need more gun laws. Wait a minute. You were, this took place in one of the strictest gun control law states in the nation. And what we saw was what everybody knows. Like you said, Ron, shouldn't intelligence play a part in this? Here's what we saw. 
the criminals had guns. The law-abiding citizens celebrating a Christmas party didn't have guns. They were sitting ducks. They were shooting fish in a barrel. And you're right. When they started screaming and running and hiding in corners and texting people saying, help me, help me, help me. I mean, I can't imagine the horror of that. I'm not making fun of them. I'm saying, this is horrible. But look at the position that the government put them in. If I were a member of one of those victims' families that was killed, or if I was one of those victims that had to huddle and got shot and shot at, I would sue the government right now, and I would say, look at the position you put me in. You did. You took away my Second Amendment right. You took away my ability to at least make a decision that morning as to whether or not I wanted to have a gun on me to defend myself in case something horrific like that happened. You took it away. You trampled on my rights. I would sue them. There's a class action lawsuit against California waiting to happen here, Mm -hmm. in my humble opinion, because the government will do all they can to take away every right we will give them. And one of the rights that the far-left liberals and the other nations of the world that intend to do us harm, and ideological systems like radical Islam, they would love to disarm America, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And one of the reasons is because a hundred-something million of us have multiple weapons as a part of our Second Amendment rights. And so the bottom line is, Ron, it's an individual decision, even for Christians. There's nothing unbiblical about having weaponry to defend your home, your life, and your family. I go into great detail on that in my book and defend it. And a person doesn't have to. doesn't make you a better Christian if you carry a gun. doesn't make you a braver person if you carry a gun. But think about it. That whole scenario, Ron, would have been drastically different had a group of people in that group had firearms. Because, look, when those guys came in, those Muslim terrorists, that's what they were, they had on body armor. Why? They didn't want to get shot. Yeah. yeah. They're... See, they were cowards. And cowards. If, can you imagine? Now, I live in the South. I live in Florida. We have concealed weapon carry permit. They're even discussing open carry. Alabama has open carry. Uh, I think Louisiana, uh, I, I can't remember, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arizona, open carry. And there are a lot of open carry states. Texas, open carry. Can you imagine if those terrorists walked into a situation like that in a concealed weapon carry or open carry state? I know, I know if they walked into a group of hundreds I get- Ron, thank you so much for thank the you, Ron. C- and, and before, when we look at this in Europe and we look at the violence and we look at things like Sharia law, does the Bible at all address this? Is there some prophetic thing we see unfolding here? Brother, <laughs> do you have two hours? <laughs> <laughs> let, listen, let me short answer some. I know the United States. But let's use Israel as an example of how God deals with nations. Now, Israel, of course, was God's covenant nation. Now, America made a covenant with God. We, we initiated that covenant through our founding fathers. But God initiated the covenant with Israel. So there's the difference. I, I, I do say America is a covenant nation, but it's kind of a, a, a different approach, a different way. We, we approach God and said, Lord, bless us. We will, you know, our founding fathers got on their knees and, and dedicated this nation to the Lord. George Washington and the First Congress did in New York City right after he was sworn in. That's a matter of historical uh, fact. But, but the bottom line is, let's deal with what God did with Israel. He said, in the day that you turn away from me, he says, I will bring your enemies, people of unknown tongues, I will bring them against you, and they will carry you off into captivity. Mm. Now, brother, do you know who he brought against them? The yeah. Babylonians. Babylonians. Assyrians and the Persians. And it was all over several hundred years, all of these different empires began to dominate them and destroy them and enslave them and massacre them and destroy the temple and destroy the city of Jerusalem and destroy the culture and the nation of Israel. Those Babylonians, Assyrians, and Persians are the equivalent of modern-day Iraq, Iran, and Middle East. The Persians, of course, in Iran today, 80% of the population of Iran, they're Persians, and they speak Farsi. 
to the Persian language. They're now aligned with Russia. Russia and China are now in the Middle East. Germany is talking about coming into the Middle East. England is talking about coming into the Middle East. ISIS controls, the hotbed of their control is the Euphrates River, Mike. Mm. Revelation 9 speaks of a World War III scenario in the last days on the Euphrates River. Revelation 16 speaks of a World War III scenario in the last days on the Euphrates River. I mean, but, and, and it speaks of it being deeply spiritual and deeply demonic. Well, what is ISIS? If it's not spiritual and demonic, what is it? If it's not religious, what is it? And so we're watching these biblical prophecies unfold. Israel is back in the land. The nations of Ezekiel 38 are aligning themselves against her. And then America, this covenant nation, if you will, and I've explained what I mean by that, we've now turned our back on God for a hundred years. We've spit in God's face told our little babies that they're nothing but monkeys and good look what look what might be happening mm. an influx of persians and assyrians and babylonians <laughs> yeah, an I, influx into our own nation our borders are broken millions of illegals flooding our nations Violence in our street, violence in our universities, violence in the workplace, violence in our schools, violence against uh, uh, Christians in America. And I'm saying, if America doesn't repent and turn back to God, I think it's only going to get worse. And I'm not trying to be a doomsday prophet. I'm just looking at what is. I used to be a cop. I take two plus two and come up with four and bring it to court. And that's what I'm doing today. There you go. Thank you, Carl. Very, very well explained. Back to our phone lines. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Stand Up for the Truth. One second, Michael. Just getting, uh... Good morning. Good morning. I would uh, have a question for Carl as a law enforcement officer, a former law enforcement officer. What would the effect be of uh, on, a, on a person wearing body armor? I realize there temperaments of people, how they're going to react, but what would the effect be of, a, of, a, of a, them being shot by a, 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 an armed citizen in a situation like that? Would it have a deterrent effect? Are they just going to bounce off or, or what? Uh, great question. Thank you. Carl, so, so these guys had this, this, these vests on. I would imagine there's some handguns that are going to cause some damage, and there's some that are going to probably ricochet off or just be absorbed. There. Did we lose Carl, Matt? I should still be there with a call back. Okay. Uh, here, give him, give him a call back. Uh, sorry about that, folks. But uh, uh, that's a very interesting question because apparently these, these Muslim terrorists did have vests on. And, you know, I, I'm a former law enforcement officer myself. I only served two undist indistinguishable years as a military policeman. But, uh, you know, so I don't know a lot about this body armor. But uh, I would imagine some of your smaller caliber handguns are going to have little little to no effect in it. Uh, some of your larger ones, maybe a three fifty seven. A forty-five might uh, at least knock these people backwards, but uh, we'll get Carl back just in a minute to address that. I thought it was very important what what Carl talked about in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, people, the Jewish people who had the Israelites who had a covenant with God, and how God used these Babylonians, Assyrians, and Persians as judgment against Israel. And I love that we explain this. We can say, well, that's just for Israel, and that very well might be true. But there are principles in God's Bible in God's word that do apply. And again, we are we are not Israel, we're the United States. We entered a one-sided covenant if you will with God. I'm not saying we're God's people, that is the Israelites. But you know what, when you make a promise to God and you break it, there's going to be ramifications sometimes. So uh Carl, are you back with us, brother? Carl, are you back with us? I am. Uh Mike, we lost connection, but I did hear the question because I have it uh I have your radio program streaming on the internet, so you're, I just turned up the volume. You're a good man. So, yeah, Randy's question was basically uh, uh with these people wearing these vests, are there certain caliber guns that are going to deter them or not deter them? Yeah. Listen, I, I was having this discussion yesterday with someone. In fact, my wife and I were discussing it cuz she remembers back in the day when I used to wear a bulletproof vest as a as a patrol officer, listen, bulletproof vests are good. Our military uses them. Our law enforcement use them. SWAT teams use them. They're good. They save lives, but they are, do not make you indestructible. They do not make you indefensible. First of all, they basically just cover the vital organs. They don't cover the face and head, which 
of course, is extremely crucial. And, of course, they don't keep you from getting wounded by being shot in the leg or the hip or, you know, the shoulder, which can be devastating. I mean, you know, you get a good slug through the hip and you're down. I mean, you are down. The other thing is there are some calibers that are not stopped completely by bulletproof material. And the other thing is, even if you have on a bulletproof vest and you get shot, even though it doesn't penetrate the bulletproof vest, you can still be killed. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, a bullet has impact, ferocious impact. And if it doesn't penetrate the body and damage vital organs that way, it can still the impact. If you get shot in just the right place in a bulletproof vest by certain calibers, it can take the wind out of you. It can deca- de- it can incapacitate you. It can put you down. It can stop your heart. It can bruise you. It can knock you out. And I mean, when I say bruise, I don't mean a little bobo. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it can you know cause all kinds of massive problems, internal bleeding. Uh, so. So a bulletproof vest is just an extra precaution, I tell people, and we were told that back when we were trained in how to use them. And it is a good precaution, and it's a wise one as a military man or a law enforcement person, but it is not a guarantee. And so I don't know if those guys still had their bulletproof vest on when they got in the shootout with the police or not. I don't know. Yeah, but, of well, course, they were... We had a listener come in and said, no, it sounds like they were wearing vests, but not necessarily bulletproof armor. But, uh, again, good good question. Hey, Carl, we've got about eight minutes left, and I do want to go back to the Middle East with you here. You know, yeah. here, Russia, for the first time ever, has troops in the Middle East. And, you know, I'm kind of remembering something in Ezekiel chapter 38 about Russia getting dragged back into the Middle East. Another sign that we're living in prophetic times? Mike. This is so huge, and, and I think so. And listen, even today, Chris Christie came out and said, look, we're in the verge of World War III. The Pope has said, we're in the verge of World War III. Media people, religious people, government figures, UN figures, all over the world. In the last four or five months, you're hearing over and over, we're in the verge of World War III. World wars start slowly. They don't happen overnight. Oh, we can, we can point to a specific thing, like when Hitler invaded Poland, said that started World War II. Well, now that's where we measure it from. But World War II was unfolding years before that. And so, you know, people are looking at what's happening, and, and, and they're saying, gosh, are we all on the verge of World War III? I mean, look what's happening around the world. Look what happened in Paris. Look what's happening in Europe. Look at the Muslim influx. Look what's happening in the Middle East. Look what's happening in China and Russia. Uh, look what's happening in America. Uh, and look at the reaction of politicians and militaries. I mean, this smells like a build-up to World War III. Well, to answer your question specifically, Ezekiel 37 and 38 are powerfully fascinating passages of Scripture that for hundreds of years commentators have been speculating, biblically speculating. And Ezekiel 37 is the prophecy that in the last days Israel will return to the land. Well, that has happened. We're the only generation in global history to see that happen. 2,500-year prophecy burst forth in 1948. Then in 1967 they recaptured Jerusalem, and boom, there they were. Ezekiel 38 says that once the nation comes back and is secure in the land, and by the way, people say, well, see, Israel's not secure. Well, it depends on how you define it. Israel is the number one Middle Eastern superpower, nuclear power, number one in the Middle East. They're the number three nuclear power in the world. United States, number one, Russia, number two, Israel, number three. So they are secure in the land in that sense. But they are surrounded by enemies. And Ezekiel 38 says that they would not only be surrounded by enemies, but there would be a coalition, a certain coalition, that would begin to form in the last days. And they would eventually rise up and come against Israel. And who is this coalition? Well, Persia is listed as one of the nations. We know that's the modern-day nation of Iran. And they were going to be in specific alliance with another nation group or a tribal area by the name of Magog. That's interesting, because, and I'm just doing the quick answer, but there are all manner of historical ways of tracing the descendants of the Magogites uh, originated out of Turkey, and then eventually infiltrated and migrated into the areas of what's now modern-day nation and the Stan countries of the world. So now we have 
We've had this spe- speculation for hundreds of years that in the very last days, Russia and Iran probably will get together and eventually will attack Israel. Mm. Well, guess what the headline news have been for the last five or six years? Oh. Russia and Iran making nice, nice, and now Russia is in the Middle East connected to Iran, and now China is there with Russia. I mean, we are living in amazingly prophetic times. That's my short answer. We could talk about it for hours. Oh, we, we definitely could. And again, we, we none of us know the day of the Lord's return. That is reserved for the Father. But we we were told, the apostles were told by Jesus, it is not for you to know the day, but, the day, but you can know by telling the signs of the season. And we, yeah. we just don't want to see those signs. And Carl, it le- leads me to another question here. Biblical prophecy from the pulpit. I, I, I talked to pastors and some of them won't touch biblical prophecy. Other ones teach only biblical prophecy. How do we correctly teach biblical prophecy but also be aware of the responsibility we have to live in these days? Yeah, thank you. Well, almost a third of the Bible concerns prophecy. And to, to not deal with prophecy is, 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 is a terrible disservice to a congregation if you're a pastor, preacher, teacher. Uh, but to deal only with prophecy, you might be doing your, your, your church a disservice as well, unless you tie uh, your prophetic preaching to the gospel message and to uh, day-to-day discipleship living as well. And that can be done, but it's, it's hard work. Uh, and I'm not saying I do everything perfectly. I've been a pastor in one church for 29 years. My people know me. They know my preaching. And one way that you can stay for 29 years is you can't preach canned sermons. You can't preach the same old stuff over over and over again. So what do you do? Well, my formula is simple. I preach the whole Word of God. I preach the whole counsel of God's Word. And there are various ways, and I keep it exciting and fresh. I, sometimes I do book studies. Sometimes I do thematic and topical studies. Sometimes I do through the Bible studies. Sometimes I do doctrinal studies. But the bottom line is, I preach whatever's in the Word, and I preach it in context. I tie it to the rest of the Scripture. I let Scripture interpret Scripture. And if you do that, you're going to deal with the prophetic. Now, Some years back, the Lord really led me into the area. I mean, he began to show me, I believe, and I'm not saying perfectly or that I see everything perfectly, and I don't claim to be a prophet. The prophets, we've got all the prophets and prophecies we need. They're in the Word of God if we just preach those. But, uh, but, But he began to show me some some insight into what's happening. And where we are today, Mike, I was predicting, if you will, again, not claiming to be a prophet, just reading Scripture and saying, folks, if I understand this Scripture correctly, we will soon have gay marriage. We will soon be dealing with an influx of Islamic refugees. We will soon be seeing a turmoil in the Middle East that is going to be something we've never seen before. We will soon see Russia in the Middle East. We will probably see China in the Middle East. I've said these things from my pulpit ten years ago, Mike. Now we're there. Now, is it because I'm a prophet? No, it's because I know what God's Word says, Mm -hmm. and I'm a student of history, and I'm a student of current geopolitical affairs, and I was making the Word relevant, and I was saying, look, folks, you know, unless God intervenes in these things, here's where we're going to be. And so look at the service I've done. My folks know this. They know what's going on. They get it. And uh, there are other preachers and pastors who have been paying attention to the Spirit's leading over the years and have done the same thing I have. I'm not the only one. But so many of them haven't, Mike. So many of them haven't. And so many American Christians, I fear, are unprepared. Again, the reason I wrote my last book, my latest book, Be Thou Prepared, Equipping the Churches for Persecution in Times of Trouble. God's people had better suck it up. Just because a great football game was on TV last night and Starbucks is open today doesn't mean all is right with the world. Oh, amen, Carl. And, and we, I, I do wish we had another two hours. I, I love the book, Be Thou Prepared, Equipping the Church for Persecution in Times of Trouble. How can people get a copy of it? Yeah, well, the quickest way is Amazon. Of course, you get it anywhere good Christian books are sold, and I mean anywhere. And, uh, and, and of course, you can go to my website, carlgallops.com, and it's there, and everything about me is there, and how to order books and materials are there. Or just put my name in Amazon. Go to my author's page. You can see all of my books there. But my latest is Be Thou Prepared. And, by the way, carlgallops.com, he's also got a YouTube channel with some great teaching on it and some great insights. So uh, I check it out frequently, and uh, i tell you what, you will not be disappointed.